Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Last week we saw Bob and Doug fly to the space station on the Dragon 2, a long-awaited return to flight for US human launch capabilities, and the first flight of humans to orbit on a privately built booster. But this was merely the end of a long journey that involved many people who would shape US space policy. So I want to ask, how did we get here? And to understand this, you have to go back to the tragic loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia and her crew in 2003. At that time, a committee of experts were appointed to investigate. They were named the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. And for some of them, the, f the more they found out about the Space Shuttle, the less safe it seemed to be. Some of them on the Accident Investigation Board actually wanted it grounded permanently. One problem they highlighted was that the retirement date had been set by NASA based upon when they expected a successor to be available. In 2001, when the X-33 was cancelled, the date of retirement was pushed back from 2012 to 2020. The final board report suggested that space shuttles could be kept flying up until 2010 with the prospect of inspection and refurbishment to extend their life. The shuttles were old in years, but they were young in terms of the flight time they'd been built for. They had expected weekly or monthly flights back when they were originally designed. But they couldn't build replacements, at least not affordably. The last time a shuttle had been built was Endeavour, and that was cobbled together out of spare parts. So restarting production would have been about as expensive as developing an entirely new launch vehicle. In 2004, the president announced the way forward with the, his vision for space exploration. Shuttle was to be set for retirement in 2010, likely based upon the conclusions that the uh, Accident Investigation Board had delivered. In the same speech, he also talked about a new generation of crew exploration vehicle. No new development money was immediately available. However, there were a number of projects already in development at NASA which might fit the bill. A year later, NASA began something called the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program. It had long been a dream of many to make commercial space services a reality. NASA wanted to generate demand by asking private companies to deliver cargo to the International Space Station. And there was a lot of resistance from to people to the idea, but the cargo delivery was seen as lower risk than other options because there were alternatives for cargo delivery from Japan, Europe and Russia, and that could fill in if things went wrong or were delayed. So the program was to be managed by the Commercial Crew and Cargo Program Office, also known as C-3PO. And with approval of the President and Congress, $500 million was set aside to fund initial development of technologies required for commercial services. So instead of strict requirements, there were guidelines on what was needed, such as the ability to launch 8.4 tonnes of cargo to the International Space Station every year, with no specification on the number of flights required or any stipulations on how the vehicle should be designed. Unlike the Space Shuttle, NASA wouldn't own the launch vehicles or the spacecraft. It would simply be buying rides on them. The intellectual property would remain with the developer. Also, the program stipulated that the development money awarded had to be matched by private investors to prevent companies being purely reliant on NASA money. The first request for proposals began in January 2006 and 21 proposals were delivered before the March 6th deadline. And these came from a range of companies including existing NASA suppliers like Lockheed and Boeing through the new space startups that we know today such as SpaceX and at least according to one account somebody who was going to build a rocket engine in their garage. After the selection process, the two finalists chosen were SpaceX, who had pitched a larger version of their Falcon 1 rocket, the Falcon 9, and rocket plane Kistler with their K-1 reusable rocket running on high-performance Russian engines. At this point, SpaceX had tried one launch of its Falcon 1 rocket, which had failed. And in 2006 was the year then that the Constellation program got a name. Bits of it had been in development since 2001, but this brought them all together under one roof. It was an ambitious program using shuttle-derived hardware for the Ares 1 and Ares 5 rockets, which would launch a new crew exploration vehicle which we now know as Orion. 
The crew exploration vehicle had been conceived in the 1990s with official planning beginning in 2004 and the contract being awarded to Lockheed in 2006. And as you know, it's still not really ready. Anyway, the Constellation program was pitched as being the replacement for the space shuttle and the program that would take astronauts back to the moon. The Ares-1 would use a single solid se uh, five-segment rocket booster derived from the shuttle design which only has four segments. It would have an upper stage that was powered by a J2X engine develop, uh, burning hydrogen and oxygen. Now the Ares-5 on the other hand was a monster heavy lift vehicle, a bit like the SLS but bigger and able to put 188 tons into low earth orbit. In 2007, the agreement with Kistler was then terminated because they had been unable to raise the private funds needed to match the NASA money. And another round of proposals were, were made. NASA chose instead Orbital Sciences Corporation with their Cygnus cargo vehicle and the Taurus II rocket, which is now known as the Antares. Meanwhile, SpaceX was in trouble. The Falcon 1 rocket launches were failing to reach orbit. The first three flights were all failures, and Elon Musk often mentions how SpaceX would have shut down if the fourth flight had not succeeded. And you'll be unsurprised to hear that in 2008, they succeeded their first launch of a Falcon 1 rocket, paving the way for their one and only commercial launch of the Falcon 1 in 2009. 2009 would also see a new president, and one of the first space policy decisions he made was to create a committee to study the current state of affairs, officially known as the Review of Hu United States Human Spaceflight Plans Committee, better known by, as the Augustine Commission after the chairman, Norman Augustine. He'd actually chaired a similar commission 20 years earlier, and so he had a lot of respect at doing this kind of thing. So the commission did their work and there was two important things that I want to highlight in their report. The first was that they found the commercial service development were exceeding expectations and they immediately recommended more funding for this. I think they got $200 million extra almost right away. But they also found that the Constellation program had never been funded at the levels required to hit its targets. And at the current funding levels, they estimated it would be as late as 2020 before it was able to launch a single crew to the International Space Station. And so in response to this, space policy changed. The president drove a stronger commitment to commercial space services, not only approving the commercial resupply services program that paid SpaceX and Orbital Sciences for delivering cargo to the ISS, but in 2010, the commercial crew development program started. It was expected that commercial crew providers would be able to develop the capability and deliver to the ISS as early as 2015. Constellation was essentially defunded and many politicians in Congress were unhappy with this, partly because they didn't really have control over the allocation of contracts to the commercial programs, so this really represented a loss of control and a loss of money to their states. In the end, the parts of Constellation that had been developed, including the Orion spacecraft and the five segment boosters and the RL-10 engine upgrades, those all became part of the SLS program. Meanwhile, huge parts of Constellation weren't useful. Much of it was still on the drawing board and the singular launch that they made was the Ares 1X, which took a regular four segment shuttle booster. It added an extension to make it look like a five segment booster. They added a boilerplate upper stage. And even that single launch with half the equipment was almost as expensive as the entire commercial crew development program to that point. It was about $400 million. SLS was less capable than the Ares 5, but it was much more likely to deliver on a reasonable timescale. Also, the Ares 1 was considered to be much more dangerous than any other human launch options proposed. Uh, there's a great paper on how dangerous this would have been. And 2010 also saw the first flight of SpaceX's Falcon 9. In fact, it's 10 years ago tomorrow on Thursday that the first Falcon 9 launched carrying a boilerplate upper stage simu uh, simulation of the Dragon capsule. The 1.0 version of the Falcon 9 is quite different from what we know today. The nine engines are arranged in a grid instead of an octaweb. Uh, the stages are shorter and of course there's no landing legs or grid fins. SpaceX did however include parachutes to test recovery. They didn't get any success with that. 
And in all of this, the most important decision was the commitment to commercial crew. Commercial cargo hadn't even been demonstrated, so to committing to privately funded crew launches requires a lot of faith in private industry, being able to deliver something completely new in a timeline faster than the existing government development process. So 2011, well that saw the, the last flight of the space shuttle. It had actually been extended by one year to allow completion of the International Space Station. 2011 also saw SpaceX's first award from NASA to develop a crew capable version of their Dragon cargo capsule. In May of 2012, SpaceX became the first private company to successfully dock a spacecraft to the uh, International Space Station in Dragon Demo Flight 2. And later that year, they began their semi-regular commercial resupply services missions to the station. 2013 brought us the Falcon 9 1.1 with the extended tanks and the silhouette that we know today. And also the first attempts at using rocket engines to land the boosters. In the early years of the commercial crew program, there were also ongoing efforts to overturn those presidential funding requests. Every few months, there'd be hearings with the NASA administrator going to Congress to ask for the program to be properly funded. This would, of course, delay development. The proposals they had expected, you know, launches as early as 2015, but the continual underfunding made those untenable. And of course, such rosy timelines didn't factor into the extra development time needed to deal with uh, problems with the parachutes, for example. 2014 also saw the actual contracts being awarded for commercial crew services with two finalists. Boeing could expect to receive up to 4.2 billion, while SpaceX's contract could earn it 2.6 billion. Now this isn't money that was paid out, this is the flights so far have all been funded through the development program. 2015 had the first actual test flight on the commercial crew program, with SpaceX demonstrating the Dragon 2 pad abort capability. However, in June, the CRS-7 mission failed due to the second stage oxygen tank rupturing after a helium cylinder broke free. Falcon 9 would be grounded during the investigation, and it returned to flight in December. This was a new variant called the Full Thrust. This used a deep chilled, densified propellant to get more performance from the same size of fuel tanks. This mission would also be the first to successfully land and recover the first stage booster at the launch site. And this booster is the one that's on display at SpaceX headquarters. By 2016, most of the funding flights over, fights over commercial crew were over. There did continue to be a steady stream of diehards looking for any excuse to redirect commercial crew funds elsewhere. SpaceX continued developing its booster recovery. They landed several boosters over the year on land and on their drone ships. However, in September, SpaceX suffered another dramatic failure on the pad when they were loading propellants to test fire the engines. There would be no more flights for the year while it was being investigated. In 2017, there was a new president in the White House, but NASA funding for commercial space operations remained essentially untouched by the new administration. Falcon 9 returned to flight, and in March, it performed the first reflight of a booster. 2017 also saw the debut of the Block 4 booster design with its upgraded engines. 2018 debuted the Falcon Heavy, and while many of you remember the Red Roadster carrying Starman off on the cruise into deep space, it wasn't hugely relevant to the commercial crew program. But later in that year, the introduction of the Block 5 version of a Falcon 9 was. Now, Block 5 was supposed to represent the final evolution of the Falcon 9 in a stable state that could be approved to fly crew. In August of 2018, the astronauts who would fly the first missions in commercial crew were announced. Of course, at that point, they were still expecting that astronauts would fly in 2019. And 2019 did see the first flight of a Crew Dragon in March. It launched safely and traveled to the space station carrying Ripley, the test dummy, a plushy Earth and some uh, extra cargo. The capsule returned to Earth and was expected to be recovered and refurbished and used for an in-flight abort test, but in April, a ground test destroyed the capsule in a fiery explosion. The investigation would take months and ultimately require a redesign of the propellant system for the abort thrusters. Uh, at the end of 2019, Boeing also performed a test flight of their Starliner spacecraft, and while the launch was perfect, 
The capsule had many problems once in space, largely blamed on poorly tested software. The capsule never made its planned rendezvous with the station, and there were enough questions raised about the flight that Boeing is planning a second test flight later this year. 2019 also saw the launch of the Artemis program, which is expected to use a lot more commercial crew capabilities or commercial launch capabilities than the original backers of the SLS predicted in 2010. And so we get to 2020. It's been a long ride, but the year kicked off in spectacular style with the in-flight abort test of the Dragon 2 capsule on an old Falcon 9 booster, literally exploding the rocket booster in the name of science. And that paved the way for the first crewed launch of Dragon, bringing to an end the gap in spaceflight that resulted from decisions made almost 20 years ago. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.